Uh, we also talked about some advances in surgical treatment. Um, that's really something that should be done with epilepsy when a person has failed a couple of drugs. Uh, they, we need to verify the diagnosis and, you know, if you think about this, the physician almost never sees the actual seizure. The patient comes in, they're fine, and they describe what happened, which they're probably not going to remember entirely, and they may not remember at all. They may just know they woke up on the floor, and they may not be a witness. So, you know, if it sounds like a seizure, you treat it with one of your traditional drugs, you know, lamotrigine, carbamazepine, whatever, the patient's fine, you don't need to worry about it, but if they failed a couple of drugs, you need to rethink that. So, you know, we bring them in for recording of the actual seizure, which may or may not be an easy thing to do, depending on how, how often it happens. Uh, but that allows us to see the actual event with an EEG, uh, with trained nurses, technologists to test the patient so we know exactly what we're dealing with. So sometimes we find it's not epilepsy. Uh, if it is epilepsy, that's a preliminary workup as to whether they may be a surgical candidate. Well, I should have started perhaps by saying that we were talking about the four newest drugs to neurologists, whereas, you know, there are 12, 20 more established drugs out there. So your average physician is not going to get down to the newest drugs in their toolbox. Um, they're going to be sticking with the ones that they know best. That's true of neurologists, it's true of me. Um, the, the newest drugs, you know, none of them are perfect. Uh, we learn a lot after they're released to the market. So in an epilepsy center like mine, we have a need. There are patients that have been through 10, 15 drugs already, and we keep trying. Unfortunately, it's kind of trial and error. Um, but you know, there are some newer options. We always have to put it in perspective. I think with any drug, but particularly in epilepsy, and we're when you're talking to somebody who is refractory, that's still having seizures, so you've got to weigh the risk versus the benefit. This is a different drug. There's a chance it may help your seizures. We really hope it will stop your seizures, but unfortunately there's no way to predict that until you try it in a refractory patient. And these are the common side effects. Uh, you can look at a package insert and you'll see 20, 30 things on there. Uh, we try to go over the more common ones because some of those, you know, they're listed in the package insert, they come from the clinical drug trials, they may not have as much relevance as what we're really seeing commonly, but you know, we always tell patients, if you experience a change that you're concerned about, you need to let me know because there's always unpredictable uh, side effects, especially when you're dealing with something that's supposed to work on your brain. Uh, pretty much every approval is initially in adults, but uh, there are nuances with the ones that might be more useful in pediatrics. Probably it's, it's safe to say that any drug that is useful in an adult may be useful in a pediatric patient. Uh, the difference is we worry a little bit more about cognitive effects in a developing child. That's always a problem, but you know, if anything, I think we're more concerned with those kinds of drugs in, in kids. Um, so toxicity is, is, if anything, more concerning in children. With older patients, there's a good chance they'll be on a number of medications, so uh, that can get very messy. Uh, many of the drugs, especially the older drugs for epilepsy, uh, change hepatic metabolism, which can change the metabolism of a lot of other drugs. That can get very, very complicated. You know, one of the concrete advantages of some of the newer ones is uh, that's less uncommon or non-existent.